Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord, I worship your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Your goodness is running after me. Man, what a testimony that is. That's definitely, if you're sitting here today, that's your testimony. You wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the goodness of God. Amen. But his goodness has been running after us. What does that mean? Half the time it's because we're running the wrong way and it has to be chasing us down. But he still loves us enough to come after us. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. God is good to us. I just want to continue on a little bit in the study of the book of Romans. I think there's a lot of good stuff in there that God's kind of dropped us into. So, um, Probably this week and next week we'll be on this topic, Law and Grace. Not law and order. I know that's a show out there. It's not what we're talking about. Law and grace is biblical, so keep it. Amen. Um, I don't even know what the show is, so if it's something horrible, I've just heard the name. I don't know what it is, so just put that disclaimer out there. Amen. <laughs> um, law and grace. John chapter 1, verse 17 tells us, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm so thankful for that today. In John chapter 1, verse, I believe, 14, it says the, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace. I, amen. I'm thankful for that, that He came and brought grace to us. Amen. But let's all just ask God right now to bless this moment. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We pray, God, that you anoint your word today. Anoint every ear to receive. God, anoint me to deliver. In Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you for your word that is alive and well today, God. We worship you and magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may all be seated. Now, I believe to really understand what grace is, we kind of have to understand the law. Because, you know, the world was in a few different dispensations. There was the time before Moses. Well, amen. <laughs> There's the time before Moses that the world was in a totally different dispensation. Um, then once God gave the law to Moses, the world was in the dispensation of the Mosaic law. That was the era that the world was under. Um, now we're in the dispensation of grace. And that is a totally different dynamic than the law was. But a lot of times you have to understand what it was to, for the law to really understand what it means to be under the dispensation of grace. To really means, you know, what it means to be where we are today. It's, you know, it's a, it's a thing that will definitely give us some thankfulness for it. Amen. But continuing, we finished up the end of Romans chapter 1. Uh, last week, last Thursday, and continuing into Romans chapter 2, it first talks about, you know, we uh, be careful how we judge because we don't want to be judging others, yet ourselves are doing the same things, and what's it talking about, the things that chapter 1 just finished up, you know, sometimes we feel like there's a huge break between 1 and 2, but it's one continued thought that chapters and verses in the Bible were added for our benefit, they're added so that we can find it easier because it would be a lot easier to say, you know, John chapter 1, than, rather than, you know, let's go to John, about the third paragraph, second, you know, sentence, you know, that'd be a little harder. So I'm thankful that they added the divisions in there, but sometimes it creates too much of a break in our minds the way that we read it. But we need to understand that really it flows from one to the next to the next. And Romans chapter 1, or 2, verse 1, it says, therefore, because of that, I don't have the verse here, but it says, because of that, what we had just read, then it goes into talking about how we shouldn't judge. But then he really starts to talk about how the law was brought in. So we're going to drop to Romans chapter 2, verse 12. And do a whole bunch of reading down probably through 29. And Amen. Um, Romans 2, 12 says, For as many as sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. That's still a principle that applies today. Jesus Christ, there's many principles in the Old Testament that, or laws in the Old Testament that were fulfilled. And that's not, that doesn't apply to us today. But there are some things about the Old Testament 
that were brought into the New Testament, like tithing, when they asked about the tithe, or when Jesus said, you know, you tithe on the mint, and, and you know, the, you tithe on your herbs from your herb garden. And he says, this you should do. So what was he doing? He's taking tithe from an Old Testament thing and bringing it into the New Testament, saying, this continues, this stays. Um, and this is also one of those things, this principle, because under the law, you weren't justified simply by hearing it. Every year, the priest would stand up and read the law, or they were supposed to. That didn't justify you. You were justified when you did the law. And Jesus brought that into the New Testament church when he was talking. He said, don't just be hearers only, but also doers of the word. He brought that into the current, saying, you know, this is something that stays with us. Uh, verse 14 says, for when Gentiles who don't have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although they don't have the law, they're a law to themselves. Um, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So this refers to what we were talking about last week, about the conscience, about the moral code that God put upon the hearts of man. And this is what he's saying. It's when Gentiles who never had the opportunity to sit and hear the high priest read the law, but yet they still, because of a conscience within themselves, they do the things that are in the law. The Bible says they're a law to themselves. And because of the code that God has printed on, just the moral code that God printed on humanity, without the law, we still have enough of that in us to kind of be a law to ourselves. And so that is what judges or... It, or, you know, basically it says you're guilty or innocent. That's what it does with the law that's within them. Um, and this is something interesting to understand because the Old Testament was a totally different, is a totally different era than we're in today. So we can't understand the Old Testament according to the rules and, you know, the, the principles of the New Testament. It's, it's its own thing. And the Bible says that the Gentiles who don't have a law they're a law to themselves, that they, um, they didn't have the law, so they're not got judged by that. That's not the, the guides that they had to follow. Verse 16 says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, indeed you are called the Jew and you rest on the law making and make your boast in God. And you know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Now, this can be a commendation, commending to somebody, or it can be um, a conviction to somebody, or condemning somebody. It depends on where you're at. Because he's talking about somebody who has the law. Um, you're supposed to, you make your boast in the law, you make your boast in God because of the law, and you call yourself a teacher of babes, and you're saying that you know it very well. So that, is, that could be commending somebody or condemning somebody, that depend on the person that, that, that he was talking to. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Uh, you who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Uh, you who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. So what Paul is doing here is he's calling to light kind of a hypocrisy. He's calling to light those who, who take the law and they... They wear it like a badge of honor. It's, it's, it's their identity. It's who they are. They're the law. They're the knowers of the law, the, the, the givers of the law, the teachers of the law. But then he's condemning them. So all that he said from verse 16 through uh, 20 is now a condemnation on somebody. He's condemning them and saying, this is what you call yourself. You say that you're a guide to the blind. You say that you're an instructor of babes. You say that you know you have the form of knowledge and the truth and the law. You know all these things, and this is what you call yourself. He says, but you're teaching the law. You're teaching thou shalt not steal. But then you're turning around and stealing. You're telling people don't commit adultery, but you're committing adultery. He's condemning them for saying, hey, 
You're speaking the law day in and day out. You're telling us how it should be. But yet in your own secret houses, your own closets, you're doing things that you wouldn't want people to know about. This is where in the Old Testament, God took the prophet and he, in, in the spirit, he showed him a hole in the wall and he just told the prophet to dig into the wall and he starts to dig and he gets into the inner court of the, the temple and he sees some evil that's going on and God tells him to go through this door and go through that door and he got all the way to the inner court of the, of the temple and he found people doing horrendous acts within the temple. And what was God doing? He's showing the hypocrisy of having a form and a fashion, but not having the reality of it, reality of it in their hearts. That's the, the people that God had to judge in the Old Testament. And this is the same type of thing that Paul is speaking to here today. He's saying that, you know, the law is more than something that you just use to make others feel bad and tell them how to live. But it's something that you need to do yourself. Because if you back up a few verses, he says, you're only justified when you do the law, not just know it, not just hear it. And because of these actions, because these people boast in the law and they, they tell everybody about the law, but they themselves go behind closed doors and break the law. What he's saying in verse 24, he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now here's a principle in the Old Testament, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain. Many times today we think it's when someone smashes their hammer and they say the name of Jesus out loud. That's not what it's talking about. How can somebody who really doesn't know God take his name in vain? Now I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying it's right, but that's not really what he's talking about when he says don't take the name of your Lord in vain. What he's talking about is don't go through the world proclaiming how you're righteous and the God of Israel is on your side and you are one of Jehovah's mighty men, but then you act worse than the sinners that you're condemning. That is what it means to take God's name in vain. Don't go out in the world and go out in the name of Jesus Christ and through the name of Jesus Christ take advantage of people and, and hurt people. And that's, no, that's taking the name of the Lord in vain. When we, his name is applied to our lives and we misuse him, misuse his power, misuse his glory, that is taking the name of the Lord in vain. So yes, it's not good when someone flippantly says the name of God as a cuss word type of scenario. That's not good, but that's really not what it's talking about. We are the ones who truly, those who know God, whose, whose name is applied to our lives, we are the ones who've got to be careful that we don't blaspheme God among the nations. Amen. Continuing on, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. This is a mouthful. This is a mouthful. What's he saying here? What's he saying here? He's basically saying if you go through all the external things to make yourself look righteous and look like you're fulfilling the part, like you're doing everything that you're supposed to do according to the law, but yet you break the law, you may as well not have done the other parts. The circumcision was in vain. The, all that you did to look like you're fulfilling the law was in vain. If you're doing it simply because that's what you're doing to make it look right. He's saying the law really has to be something deeper than just a cutting away of the flesh. Than just a, um, you know, something external. It's not just something that is outward. It's exterior. It's not just something that's outwardly. But it's really, it's something that's inwardly that comes out. It's something that's within you that flows out of you. Yes, he's saying you're supposed to fulfill the law. You're supposed to fulfill everything but not just the parts that you want to fulfill to make it appear that you're looking good and that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do. Amen. Now, I really feel, though, that chapter 2 kind of brings a lot of, like, wait a minute, question marks about the law. What are you, man, what, Paul, what are you talking about here? And that's what I love about the Bible. I've heard a principle said, and it's something that stuck with me, and it really, um, 
it has guided my study, and it's this, that if the Bible raises a question, then use the, the Bible will answer it. I'm not going to, if the Bible raises a question, I'm not going to go outside the Bible to figure out what the answer is. If Alice, and I say, how's your day going? She says, well, that raises a question. Allison's day is bad. And I go to Patty, and I say, oh, what's wrong with Allison's day? I don't know. I wasn't. It doesn't make sense, does it? So if the Bible raises a question, don't go outside the Bible to answer it. Look within the Bible, and it will answer its own questions because the Bible knows what it's talking about. It, it, you know, the, the Word of God made flesh. You know, the Bible, it's a part of who God is. We need to understand it's not just words on a page, but it's a part of who God is. It's His Word to us, and it's alive today, and so it answers every question. Uh, go to Romans chapter 7. And here I will be reading in the New Living Translation, the NLT. Romans 7, starting at verse 5. It says, When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. Now you've got to understand, Romans chapter 7, that's, that's after he goes through living in the flesh and all that stuff. And now he's talking about living in the spirit. So here's kind of the answer to what Romans chapter 2 is questioning. What about the law? There's so much about this. How can I understand it all? Now he's kind of starting to give us the answer. And he says that we don't serve God just by the, obeying the letter of the law, but we serve God living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Good question, Paul. Are you telling me that the law is sin now? Are you saying that it's sin to obey the law? Good question. Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. There's certain things within us that the conscience, thou shalt not murder, that's something that's within us. We kind of understand without anybody telling us that I can't take another person's life. When we take something that doesn't belong to us, we steal. There's a conscience within us from birth that we understand that that's not right. We know that, hey, that's not something that should be done. But sometimes there's other things in our lives that come up, covetousness that leads to theft and leads to other things. We don't understand that, and so the law is what pointed it out that, hey, that is sin, that you shouldn't do it. Without that, he was doing these things, he's saying, and, but the law now exposes it and points it out and says, this is, this is sin to covet, so don't do it. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. What do you mean, Paul? If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life. Now sin's alive, and verse 10 says, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead confusing. Paul, what are you saying? Basically this. Have you ever had like a little kid come in the, in the kitchen when you're cooking cookies? Let's say you're making your baking cookies. Johnny, don't you touch them cookies. That's the only thing Johnny can think about now is them cookies. If you wouldn't have said it, maybe he would have passed through because he was looking for his ball. But the moment that you say, don't touch, that's all Johnny can think about. And many times that's the way it is with kids. When, when they're toddling around and we, we're living through grown-up eyes and we understand things. And so we kind of, we instruct them and we guide them according to our grown-up understanding. But they just may be toddling and they reach out and they touch the wall right next to the outlet. No, 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 touch that. And now that arouses the curiosity with them and says, wait a minute. What's the big deal about touching this? And that's what he's saying about the law. What did it do? It gave sin a foothold because in our unredeemed flesh, 
Thou shalt not covet. Coveting, that sounds good. Maybe I should do that. Thou shalt not steal. Hmm. Stealing, I wasn't thinking about that, but now that it mentions it, hmm, that's what it does within us sometimes. It's, it gives our flesh these suggestions of things to do, even though it's trying to lead us away. But why? That's because of unredeemed flesh, unredeemed life, of living in our own power and our own strength. And it gives us sin that wants to reign our lives power now because now it doesn't just have suggestions that it can give to us, but now there's an expanded knowledge. That's why... Um, you know, many things that happen to children at a young age messes with them because they don't have the years of knowledge and experience to know how to handle that understanding of things. So that's why it's so horrible on, when people abuse children in certain ways that it, it puts within them an understanding that this is, there's something more to this and what's, they don't know how to process these, these, these feelings yet and these, this knowledge yet. And that is what the law did to us without the power of God within us. It revealed things to us. It brought knowledge of things to us. Just like Adam and Eve, they're going through the, through the garden and God said, you just don't touch that tree. And then temptation comes along and says, you know why he says don't touch the tree? The law, don't touch the tree, in and of itself was good. It was for their protection. But now the power of sin was unleashed to come to them. You don't touch the tree because it's really good for you. It'll give you knowledge. And this unknown, they don't know how to handle the, the understanding of this that the law brought now. And so without the power of God, they just fall prey to it. And that is what the Bible is saying. This is what Paul is telling us here, that that's what the law did within us. It awakened the power of sin. It gave it so much more to deal with in our lives because the law exposed to us so much more sin. You ever read the Old Testament law? There's a law about everything. There's a lot of things that I guarantee you, you never thought about in your life. But now you're thinking about it. Because it's a law. Because it's read. Because it's said there. And it gives your flesh something to ponder on to think. Wait a minute. Without the power of God working within you. And that's why he said before he goes through this, he says, you know what? We're not supposed to just live by the letter of the law. Because sometimes there's things in there that our flesh, we just don't know how to handle it within ourselves. We, don't, we just don't live, okay, I'm going to fulfill every letter of the law. In my own strength. I don't do that. How do I do it? I live a new way living in the spirit. Why? Because the spirit gives me the ability to fight this temptation that comes. This understanding of things that comes to me. It says no to things and gives me the power and the strength within to be able to say no to things. And what did he say? The power of sin came to life because of the law. It, it revealed so much to me and I died within me. I spiritually died. That's what Paul said. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. The day that they partook of that, they spiritually died. There was a death that took place within them, a death of innocence, a death of, of walking in unity and God. That died that day because the power of sin was unleashed. Amen. Verse 11, continuing on. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But how, uh, verse 12, but still the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. So even though sin misused the law to bring death in my life, the law still is upright is what Paul is saying. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. This exposes sin and its terribleness. It exposes how evil it really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human and a slave to sin. This is an understanding of the law now. That it just brought about the letter of the law. It brought about the, you know, what does the Bible say? The letter killeth, but the law giveth, or but the spirit giveth life. The letter of the law, it killeth. It just brings death. It's just, 
And that is what grace has freed us from. I'm not getting too much into grace today, but really that's what grace has freed us from. Grace has exposed sin in our lives. The law has exposed sin in our lives. We know that it's there, but grace gives us a way to escape it. Grace gives us an escape from it. Just like Noah, hey, build an ark. That was grace. That, that was grace to Noah to escape the sin of the world around him. And here's another verse, Romans 5, 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Let's read uh, Romans 5, 13 in the New Living Translation. It says, Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. So before the words, Thou shalt not commit adultery, people committed adultery. Before the words, Thou shalt not steal, people stole. It, it wasn't that the law made sin happen. People were doing these things before that. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. There wasn't a rule to break. Sometimes, I mean, we can, you know, if you're speeding down the highway, well, if there wasn't a speed limit sign, I wouldn't have to get busted, right? If there's no speed limit sign there, like the Autobahn, you can go whatever you want as long as it's safe because there's no speed limit there to break. But if you turn off onto a side road, there's speed limits you've got to obey. There's a law now in effect that you have to obey. That is what this is talking about. There wasn't really a law yet. There was just the moral consciousness that was imprinted upon humanity, but there wasn't a law yet for people to break. So even though they're sinning, they were doing things that were wrong against the flesh. And many times this is where people will say, well... You know, this one had this many wives. Well, when was the law put into effect? We got to look at these things in the Bible. We can't just take someone that misuses the Bible to, you know, like uh, like he said in Romans seven, you know, the sin misuses the law of God to to bring about sin in our lives. It misuses the law to bring about death. Um, we cannot allow that to happen in our lives. So we look at okay, when did God in, uh, write this law? When did God set into motion what He defines morality as that's what we go off of as our moral compass not what somebody did thousands of years ago amen we look at what god has set into place not what humanity did because even before the law was given people were sinning people are doing things that weren't right but it wasn't imputed it wasn't counted as sin to them because there wasn't a law in place yet for them to follow this is a little bit of an understanding of the law god brought the law because he saw that humanity was just going through life, doing whatever they thought was right, doing whatever pleased them. And, you know, Noah's day, the Bible tells us that sin was rampant in the world and people were just doing whatever they wanted. The Bible tells us that they were marrying and giving in marriage. Does that mean that marriage is bad? No, it just means they were living life how they pleased. They were doing whatever they felt, that whatever felt good to them, whatever sounded right to them, they were just doing it, they did, but they didn't have God in their thoughts. The Bible tells us that in Noah's day that God wasn't anywhere in their thoughts. And that was why judgment came. is because they were so far removed from any thought of God and any thought of living for God. And that's why there's certain people in the Bible like Job. The Bible calls him a righteous man. How was he righteous? He lived before the law was given. He was righteous because he lived every day burning a sacrifice before God, coming before God and worshiping him every day. And his God was in his thoughts and he tried whatever moral code was printed upon his heart. He followed that and said, well, I'm going to do things that are right. I'm going to do things. And even before the law was written, he said, why would I look upon a, a virgin to lust after her? Why would I allow that to happen? That's what Job said in his heart. And he was saying, I'm living upright before God, even before there was a law. And that's all that it was to live upright before God was just to follow him and do the best you could. There was a law. And God said, that's not good. Because he also, in the Bible, he says that he knows the heart of man, that it's deceptively evil. It's, it's deceptively wicked. Our heart is deceptively wicked. It tries to lead us down the wrong way. So God said, let me give a law so that man knows what they should and shouldn't do. So that they have something to follow. But it was imperfect. Why? Not because of the law. The law was perfect. If you follow the law, you lived a good life. It was better for you physically. It was healthier for you. Um, I mean, it was just when you followed the law, it was better for your life. But the problem was not with the law. The problem was with humanity. Paul said this. He says 
in Romans 7 14, he said the trouble's not with the law. It's spiritual. It's good. It's a good thing. But the, really, the trouble's with me. For I am just too human. I'm just a slave to sin. This is what he's saying. Romans 5, 19 through 21 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to read those same three scriptures in the New Living Translation here. Romans 5, 19 through 21 in the NLT. It says, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the reality of it is, is that even though we may look and think that the law is horrible, you know, the law unleashed the power of sin, it gave it more to work with, the law did all these things, but in reality, the law did one thing, and that was to expose to us our evil hearts, to expose to humanity the things that we're doing that are really wrong. It's letting us know, hey, there's sin in your life, even when we didn't understand it. And the law really, it didn't, it didn't change how humanity acted. It just changed how we understood how we're acting. Now the law exposes to us. It's just like when you walk into a dirty room and you flip on the lights and the cockroaches, they take off. They were there the whole time. You just didn't know it until you clicked the light on. That is what the law did. It turned the light on inside of our rotten hearts, of our flesh, and let us know that, hey, you think you're doing pretty good, but read the law and understand that there's really some roaches crawling around. There's really some, some mess in your heart. And that's what the law did, but the law also did something else. It unlocked the ability for God's grace to become more and more abundant. The Bible tells us where sin abounds, grace does abound so much more. So where the law, we may look at it as something, oh, it's so hard, and how can anybody do this? And I'm thankful that God has given me guidelines and things I should do and things I shouldn't do because that helps keep my flesh within the guardrails. But I'm thankful for something else, and that is grace that has come and has reached out to me and has shown me that, hey, the law is not the end of the story. The law, it's an exposing. It's letting you know, hey, there's a choice to make, but that's not the end of the story because there's always grace that is reaching, that's saying, hey, come, come out of there. You don't have to be bound to the law of sin and death. You don't have to be bound to the, the law of the world, but you can come out of that. I'm thankful for the grace. And I'm thankful that now I just don't live according to the letter of the law. I don't live hypocritically. I don't live pharisaically. I live according to what Paul said. I live in the Spirit. That is where victory is found. That is, the, that is what grace is leading us towards. It's leading us out of just trying to pick our way through the law by our own power and strength. But it's leading us to a place where His Spirit can fill us and help us to to walk circumspect in this world, to, under, to understand that, hey, we're living in a world that sin is abounding, but His grace is leading me. His grace is guiding me. Amen. So we can all stand this evening. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now, God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that there is a grace that is reaching out to us.
There's a grace that's saying, hey, I want to deliver you from the law of sin and death. I want to deliver you from the clutches of the law. I want to deliver you from the clutches of living life by your own power. And I want to give you something that will help you, that will walk with you, that will be your guide, that will be your comfort. Amen.